second um, work session for the Board of County Commissioners. Just a quick reminder that we do not take any action nor public comment during these work sessions as an opportunity for a presentation and discussion amongst the commission. Jill, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm excited to have this opportunity for you all to kind of take a deeper dive into the work of the um, um, uh, Early Childhood Community Center project. Um, it's part of a larger effort that's been underway for at least a couple of years now, um, stemming out of some long time discussions around how do we expand high quality child care in the community? How do we provide those resources? and supporting resources to our most vulnerable community members um, and um, the work that the Children's Community Center has been doing for a good amount of time already. Um, but a lot of this has um, got a lot of energy coming out of the Anti-Poverty Community Health Plan, which Douglas County is a lead facilitator of. Um, um, early care and early childhood is one of the focus areas of that and kind of the primary project coming out of the work of that group has been the early care, early childhood community center project. Uh, Kim Polson's here today to provide you with an overview of the project, um, how far it's come um, in the last few months, even since you, you heard about the project um, related to American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, some exciting news that they have recently and where they're headed in the future. So I'm going to hand it off to Kim and let her start the PowerPoint. Hopefully, fingers are crossed. Okay, there we go. I'm Kim Polson with the Community Children's Center, and we are the administrative arm that is overseeing the work related to an early childhood community center in Douglas County. Um, what I want to do today is give you an update um, as to what's been happening since I was last here, which was related to the award of ARPA funds, um, and let you know what progress has been made from that point, and then where we are headed over the course of the next 18 months or so to give you a, an idea as to um, the progress we've we've already made and where we intend to go. Um, I did appreciate that I was able to meet with Commissioner uh, Willie um, one on one to get her up to speed on the project. So hopefully everybody's in the in the same place as we jump into this, um, looking at where things have come since the end of July. I did want to first give an update on early childhood care and education in Douglas County right now because um, it's shifting. It always does. And um, so it's important to keep our eye on the ball and, and be able to look at those numbers and assess, have things changed? Have we lost providers? Have we gained providers? Um, so what I want to do is give you the most up-to-date information related to that. So Right now, um, and this is all coming through Child Care Aware of Eastern Kansas, licensed providers are um, required to respond um, quarterly to Child Care Aware and indicate um, their uh, capacity, um, vacancies, costs, all of that information. So what we're looking at right now is there are 7,362 children under the age of six. And um, a little over 5,600 of those have all parents in the labor force at this point. Right now, we're still where we are um, we're related to infant care, infant and toddler care, whereas for every one spot, there are up to 10 children in Douglas County who could fill that spot. So we still know that is our, our greatest area of need right now. Um, evenings and weekends, you'll note there we have uh, seven little uh, child care, licensed child care facilities that are able to provide some evening care. Weekends, we have four licensed facilities in Douglas County and overnight care, there's only one. We actually lost um, an overnight care facility um, over the course of the last five months since we last met. Uh, the Average annual cost of care for an infant is still um, over $13,500, um, more than the cost of tuition and fees for the University of Kansas. And we are at 47% um, capacity, which means for every four, out of 100, 47 kids, we have a spot. For the other 53, we do not. 
at this point in time. That has dropped from 63%, which was a much better um, looking outcome um, from this summer. So that shows what can happen just when we lose one licensed child care center or several home-based providers um, over a period of time, the capacity can drop pretty significantly. So right now we're at the state where we need almost 3,000 potential child care slots. So if we had those slots, we'd be able to provide child care for those families who wanted to re-engage in the workforce or who wanted their child to be in a child care and education environment. Um, one of the things I do like to point out is that we are doing pretty well in relation to the number of spots available um, for those who are at preschool age and pre-K age. So we still know that, that these, these gaps are happening um, within the infant toddler areas. What, yeah, absolutely. How does this data compare to other communities in Kansas? Um, what I will tell you is that we actually are looking pretty good um, related to other communities, particularly our rural communities. Um, as we're looking at other um, peer communities, we're probably right at the same level they are. We seem to be having the same challenges in the same areas. Um, and to the extent that um, infant and toddler care as we are all in the same boat. So I think we're, we're comparable to our other areas that have a similar population, um, but the situation is very dire across the state overall, particularly when it comes to our rural areas where there are very few um, licensed facilities. So if they lose one of those facilities, the impact is, is significant. When we lose a facility, obviously it still has an impact and an immediate one for the families um, who are in, that, in their care or looking for care. So we do see an impact even from the loss of one or two facilities for Douglas County. One of the things I wanted to take you to, and I'm taking my own life in my hands by going to a website outside of the PowerPoint. So we'll see what happens. Because I want you and everybody who's, who's listening to be empowered to be able to get capture this data when they, anytime they want to. So, um, gotta switch. Okay. So, um, Child Care Aware, who is a great resource for us acro across the state, across the country, um, and particularly Child Care Aware of Eastern Kansas, is working very closely with us in our efforts. Um, what we want to do is, is provide um, some power to those individuals who are interested in this particular issue. So, there is a particular site on child care where it's called point in time data where you can click on any county and this hopefully will help when you want to look at those comparisons how are we doing related to other particular areas of our state if we click on douglas county we are brought up a report that is dated today that has those numbers that i just shared with you and more um, so it has very specific information related to um, capacity but also has information if you go to the second page of information that you also have um, the costs related to different types of care. Um, so you can get a good sense of what things cost here um, in Douglas County and what families are, are needing to come up with to make uh, child care work for them in our community. So I encourage you, um, that link should be available in the information that was provided to you in your, in your uh, packet before this session. So you will be able to go out and do this at any point in time. I do. Let's see how quickly we can make these things happen. Nope. Maybe not. We'll get there. Because there is another page I want to take you to as well. So we're going to do this again. Just be prepared. Because it's a very good indicator. There we go. So we'll go. Actually, I'll just take us to this right now on the internet.
and it can't reach my page. Let's do this. Okay, then we need to reshare from here. Okay, so the next thing I, I, I want to talk about is a little bit when we come back to after looking at what those costs look like for different types of care, um, whether that's full time part time depending on the age range between birth to five, um, as well as after school care those are all uh, bits of information you can get from that. But another tool is costofchildcare.org and this is really helps frame. Um, the our approach in Douglas County in a way that I think is relatively simple because I will tell you budget modeling for child care costs is complex. Um, and so being able to take a look at some of these uh, particular drivers will make a big difference. So if we go into Kansas, we are able to see um, right now that monthly costs for child average $1,295 for an infant classroom. So you see that we're highlighted there with infant. So what we are focused on in Douglas County is increasing the quality of childcare and education across the community. We are focused on not just having childcare spots available, but they need to be high quality childcare spots that are also affordable for families to utilize. But as soon as we take those factors that we know are quality drivers, we know that make a difference in um, family experience, child development, um, academic outcomes, we begin to see that number shift for us. So we know fewer, teacher, uh, fewer children per teacher is a quality driver. So as soon as we do that, we see that cost begin to rise pretty significantly. Um, that's one of the things where the state of Kansas actually has um, very restrictive um, ratios related to infant care, where it's one teacher per three children. Um, so we know that we have that built into our regulations to a certain extent. If we want to look at increasing the wages of our early childhood workforce, which we know needs to happen, um, right now we have those individuals who are making on an average less than $12 an hour um, in our state. So we know that if we begin to increase salaries, that goes up even more. We don't want to just increase salaries. salaries. We want to raise um, the the awareness that early childhood education is just as valuable as education overall, that there's no less value between teaching a toddler and teaching a seventh grader. So we want to elevate the profession. We know also it is the most important time for brain development in the first five years. So we want to, a high quality of education at that point the outcomes are exponential um, in comparison. So if we wanna increase those salaries, we wanna go even further if we and pay teachers the same as kindergarten teachers. So when we do that, it toggles off the increasing salaries, but it's because the rate is even higher at that point and takes us over, over $2,000 for a monthly cost per child, for, for an infant. We wanna do for this profession, what is done for other education professions, providing retirement benefits, providing health insurance benefits, providing more time for teachers to plan lessons. We know that is a quality driver if educators have planning time to plan thoughtful um, curriculum that we know is, is up to date and the most current opportunities in education. We also know that then increases because we have to have staff to allow for that. We also know that more space per child to explore, create, and learn also is a quality driver. And we also know that those high quality curriculum materials makes a big difference as well. So being able to utilize the most current um, evidence-based curriculum 
uh, giving the opportunity to, for early educators to have access to that. So when we account for all those things that we would love to have happen in Douglas County, that every family I think would love for their child to have access to, we're over um, $2,600 a month in what it would cost to have an infant in that care. Even in a toddler classroom, we know that that's still going to be over $1,500 a month as we look at a toddler scenario. So this is significant in terms of what it costs to provide high quality education in early childhood at, and at any age. So we're, our plan is to focus on those aspects of early childhood that make it a high quality environment. Get us back into our PowerPoint presentation and then we'll do the share screen first and then come back oh. to this. There we go. So once we take a look at that, why is it so expensive? Hopefully that provides a little bit of, a, of an understanding. And when other people ask, it's a very fairly simple way to say, what does this, what difference does it make to have this? What do the ratios mean? Um, and there's more information on the costofchildcare.org website that can help explain that. When we started back in, um, in our work, this is our Douglas County model for early childhood system change in our community. Um, some things have shifted since uh, the last time we spoke related to the model. Now we still have our three prongs, um, obviously high quality childcare and education, a robust family resource center to wrap around families with young children, and an early childhood professional support network. You'll remember we were calling that a provider academy. We've shifted the verbiage there because what we determined was what we can provide that is unique and that is not being provided through another entity is the support to walk providers through the process of becoming licensed, of maintaining licensure, of updating their curriculum, of, of finding a site in which to, to have a um, childcare facility. So we shifted that knowing that the support that we can provide is different because the state is actually moving towards um, an early childhood professional pathway. And so we're partnering with them on that and we're focusing on where we can help support individuals as they walk through that. And in the middle, middle of that is the Early Childhood Community Center Project. So knowing again, that is in this, the center, it's a hub of which families can come to resources, but it's also the center and the home base for the outreach that we have going on because we know families and early childhood professionals can't always make it to a location. So we have actually begun providing services for both um, early childhood professionals and families already um, through outreach efforts, even though we don't have the early childhood community center um, actually renovated and up and running yet. One thing that we also added is the encompassing of the entire model within the family-friendly workplace. We now know that any change in our early childhood systems has, has to be broader than the early childhood sector. We know it's got to involve our community our, and our employers need to engage in this process as well because early childhood care and education is good for business. Um, it oftentimes people are saying it's it's not my issue. My employees may not have children, or you know that's only a small portion of our of our employment. Um, but it does impact overall because it it is retention, which right now is a huge challenge in all areas and all sectors. But also the fact that um, when a coworker who has a young child is is lost at a loss for childcare, that impacts all the other coworkers who need to work in that space to be able to take care of, of the additional load when that individual may be home with a sick child or child care has fallen through um, and they need to stay home with their child. So the family friendly workplace, you're probably are probably aware because Douglas County is one of the big supporters of this as well and has already um, participated in the fam family friendly workplace survey that we are promoting across the county to gather data so employers have more knowledge 
um, have more current knowledge related to what their employees need and want because the things have shifted post COVID as to what employees and employers can do for one another um, and, and how they might do that. <clears throat> so progress to date. So the Douglas County ARPA Award, uh, we are very thankful um, for that award was in July. Since then, we have um, acquired 346 Main Street. We were able to make a, a fairly quick transaction related to that property. So we closed on August 30th. Um, we were able to start our um, request for proposals for design build team to support us in that renovation process. We have also had provider open houses. We have had our resource library launch for our early childhood professionals. So we are getting to a point where we able, are able to make those connections. Now, part of that um, open house and that resource launch is that we have a resource library in collaboration with Child Care Aware and Positive Bright Start, where they have a number of curriculum kits that they have had for years that have never been used because it's in a position, it would, they were in places where it was difficult for early childhood professionals to get to them, to pick them up. What hours are you going to do that um, when you have children in your care from probably 7 a.m. to 7 p.m.? So what we've done is we've created an online um, uh, tool within our Tykes Douglas County page where they can scroll through, see all of the resources, the theme kits that are available. There's over a hundred of them and they can select, fill out a form, tell us what they want, when they want it. One of our early childhood professionals in our on our team will then deliver it to them. They will also pick it up from them. Typical time of checkout is two weeks. Um, oftentimes what we find are happening, we have um, early childhood professionals who are using it right now is that they then request the next one and we do a swap. And so they are now being able to infuse their curriculum with high quality tools and resources um, without having to invest any of their own dollars in those curriculum materials and able to keep things fresh and engaging for, for not only their children, but also for them um, to be able to have some excitement surrounding new materials in their spaces. Um, so we definitely appreciate that um, resource library and that collaborative relationship. What we also find is by having an, a professional go to and deliver is that is a, now a home visit for that early childhood professional. It is now time to say, what are your challenges? What are your needs? Um, do you have families that need ex additional resources? Um, and be able to get that information to and from one another so we can continue to support them in other ways and develop new programming that can support them. September, um, we selected our design build team. We were very pleased to have five uh, design build teams submit proposals. Um, it was a very challenging <laughs> decision to make because they were all amazing ideas and um, all had some level of local connection. So we um, ended up selecting um, Bartlett and West as our design team with Dahl Construction as our um, build team, as our general contractor. Um, great opportunity to work with some local talent who, um, who live in this community and have raised children in this community. Um, Dahl Construction, who is our, our general contractor for the work has also been heavily involved in um, design and building of other childhood structures um, and facilities in our community, including Rain Tree. Um, we had a kickoff meeting for the design build process. Um, we engaged our um, individuals who were able to come up and have that kickoff and open com communication related to um, the design build process. And I'll have a little bit more something exciting related to that toward the end. Um, we hired a family resource center coordinator. Um, that individual has been uh, with us since September 6th. And without any promotion of having this new resource available, the outpouring of need has been significant. Um, we have, she is engaged with, within her first couple of weeks, she had engaged with 10 different families. 
and connected them to resources. And there, our Family Resource Center coordinator is also able to function in ways that are different than other social work environments might be. She has some flexibility and is a little bit more nimble in um, the fact that one family needed many supports. She went with her, uh, that family, with that parent to Just Food, held her child as she went through Just Food for the first time, and they walked through that together. She went with her to one of our play groups. She was like, I don't want, I don't know anyone. Okay, I'll go with you. Went to the first play group, has been a regular attender since then, um, and connected to other resources in our community um, as well. So we found that has been a highly utilized um, service uh, for our, our families. And I'm excited that we'll be able to have additional Family Resource Center coordinators very soon. Um, I was also able to present at the state level, All In For Kansas Kids, um, biweekly webinars uh, through the Kansas Children's Cabinet. Um, they invited me to speak to get an update on where we are with this. Uh, we've presented several times. Um, what we are doing in Douglas County is very innovative um, and there's a lot of interest around it at the state level. So I think that is a, a good opportunity for us to be able to talk about what we're doing, get input from other communities as well. But what we found is that um, everyone is very interested in what we're doing. October 22nd, uh, October of 22, we opened our uh, early childhood clothing closet. Um, that is at the Kennedy Early Childhood um, Center where we have one whole space within that building that is an early childhood community closet available with clothing and shoes and supplies free of charge to families um, with children from um, five and under, and then also maternity clothing. Um, we're trying to fill that gap where if someone goes to another uh, community clothing closet and they can't find what they need, they know they can direct them to us and we are doing the same. Um, so we have this collaborative relationship with other clothing closets in our community. Um, that has been highly utilized. We didn't even promote it initially. And um, I made one comment on a post in, the, in a Lawrence Mommy Network group on Facebook and we had five families within two days from one little post. So um, the need is out there and we, that has only increased um, over the past month. We started a, a, our new parent series, Responsive Caregiving. Um, this is a series that is specific to providing trauma-informed practices for parents and caregivers. Um, it's a six session series. We're collaborating with restaurants in the community who are pro providing meals free of charge. Um, we're having childcare obviously at those sessions. Um, so we are now into, I believe last night was the third session. And big news. We received the um, Department for Children and Families, we received a Family Resource Center grant. They um, had an, an RFP out for communities in Kansas that were interested in starting Family Resource Centers. Um, we applied and were one of the 10, community, 10 awards that were, were made. So with that, that's um, over $200,000 for the next 20 months. And then it's, uh, there are three one-year renewals at $125,000. So that goes a long way towards um, a sustainable model for our Family Resource Center for the foreseeable future. Kim, is that how you intend to have new Family Resource? Yes. Sorry, the oh, sorry. <laughs> Yes, um, and that is how we, we plan to be able to hire um, another um, Family Resource Center staff person. So actually, I just put out the position description um, last night. Could you talk just a little bit, Kim, about how do you get the referrals for, those, for the Family Resource Center? How do, where do those referrals come from? Because I think it's really unique and important. Yes, um, oftentimes within social service agencies, you'll find that there are referrals back and forth between um, nonprofit organizations that provide different services, but we have found that we are getting referrals from entities that may have never referred to a type of service like this. Um, we are getting referrals from childcare providers. We are getting referrals from childcare centers. Um, we're getting connections from Success by Six or Centro Hispano or other organizations who have their specific area in which they can serve. But if that family also has young children, 
it's it's an automatic hey let's refer you to community children's center because we know families with young children have unique needs and so having that additional resource available is is huge is that what you were asking Jill? yeah so we are finding though that we are getting some referrals from different entities that normally aren't using social service referrals um we're getting referrals as well from um families who have gone who have recommended other families to make contact and kind of go to the clothing closet or or talk with our family resource center outreach coordinator so then um, that's the best kind um, are those referrals that come directly from families who have been served and then november 1st um up to yesterday there's a family friendly workplace symposium um that was held at the lead center yesterday that Jill uh, was also at, um, where we were able to have conversations um, hosted by uh, WorkWell, a subcommittee of Live Well Douglas County, as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, able to start having some of those discussions um, about family-friendly workplace and what does that look like and across the county and how could, um, business entities access the family-friendly survey that is available free of charge um, to start gathering some data points from their employees. We also submitted um, our application for industrial revenue bonds with um, the city of Lawrence, um, and we'll be working through that process over the next month. So that's progress up to yesterday. <laughs> Any questions on up to yesterday? All right, so moving forward, where are we headed? Um, this month, we are actually doing some site visits to other child care facilities, um, other um, early childhood centers that are somewhat community-based to try and get some inspiration as it relates to building design. Um, and um, we are also doing a thorough uh, review of possible tuition models um taking um into account things like how do dcf subsidies play into a tuition model um as we've mentioned before we are approaching this from a sliding scale in order to be as equitable as possible um and so we are working forward with that just to see what the gap is between um what families can afford to pay and what high quality education costs and then figuring out that gap and figuring out strategic ways to fill that. Um, in December, we'll have our renovation plans and costs will be, will be solidified. Uh, that's in the process right now. The good news is, is that all of the initial assessments, building assessments, structural um, condition assessments have, have been stellar and that it's a very solid building, good building, good bones to work with, um, so we haven't had any surprises related to that yet. In January 2023, um, we anticipate beginning those renovations um, that we're working for. Those designs hope to have all that settled by the end of this calendar year and begin renovations first thing in January. Skip all the way to January 2024. Um, we anticipate that those renovations will be complete. We have, um, I was a little concerned with what would the timeline be for this type of renovation and project? Um, and I was pleased to see that all of our um, design build candidates, all of them submitted a timeline in which they felt they could have the renovations completed with, within a calendar year. Yeah. yeah. Yes, so obviously we'll ma be maintaining everything that's happening in the Kennedy Early Childhood Center over the course of the next year's renovations begin. Um, and then we plan to still have a presence in that building um, once we have moved our main functions or our core staff offices over to 346 Main Street. Um, the Early Child Clothing Closet is already established there. We're looking to see um, about use and numbers over the course of the year, because if, if it is a highly used location, then we will simply open a second location in 346 Main Street and, and maintain that there. We also have um, programming already happening at Kennedy Early Childhood Center, which includes um, a Grow and Go series, which 
um, provides different opportunities each week for parents with young children to experience things such as a different developmental um, opportunity. So we've had everything from baby yoga to dance for, for early childhood, block fest, which is a whole um, developmental um, activity around building. Um, so we have a different thing each week so families can come, experience a different developmental component. There's an educational component that goes with it, along with it being just a lot of fun and a good socialization activity, both for the parent, caregiver, and the child. So we do plan to maintain those. Um, we also plan to, of course, um, with the Kennedy Early Childhood Center, is we want to maintain relationships as it, come, as it goes with training new professionals for the field because there are unique experience that, experiences that can happen in the, in the Lawrence Public Schools classrooms that are at Kennedy Early Childhood Center. So we want to make sure as we have new professionals coming through and having experiences in our, in our place as a business incubator model, but then we also want to be able to have them have opportunities to, to have experiences there as well. Does that answer your question? Great. And then we anticipate by the fall of 2024 that we will have our child care staff hired and classrooms open. Now you, you ask why is there a, um, a gap between January 24 and fall of 24 before those classrooms are open. Our goal is that we will open classrooms that we know are sustainable. So when we come up with those sustainable models, we will make sure that as we open each classroom, that that classroom can be continued um, and maintained. Part of what we do not wanna have happen is that we open seven classrooms at one time in January of 2024, and we discover um, that either the need is not what we thought it was or that the model um, is we need to tweak the model somewhat or um, that the role of the private sector investment um, may be different um, because it may be related to having employee access to childcare spots as a benefit. Um, it may be sponsorship of classrooms. So we're looking at all of those as possible models. And so we wanna make sure that we do this in a way that we are not going to add to the confusion that happens when a childcare classroom or a childcare facility needs to reduce due to staffing issues, which is particularly the biggest challenge right now is that we find we have entities that have um, spaces that could be utilized for childcare right now, but they can't staff it. So we wanna make sure we always have that in place before we open a classroom. When you say fall of 24, is that the beginning of opening classrooms or is that when you hope to have them? I would hope that we would have um, multiple classrooms functioning by fall of 2024. I'm giving myself a little grace and wiggle room because we never know what happens. And we also don't know what happens when it comes to elections and we don't know what happens when it comes to uh, state and federal support. So we're giving ourselves um, as gracious of a timeline as we can so we can meet expectations. Commissioners, I really have to have you talk into a microphone. <laughs> Sorry. You gotta keep it for now. Because we could kind of share. So during that time frame as well, we will be going through a capital campaign, which starts um, our quiet phase is, is beginning. Um, yet this calendar year, but we'll be launching into a capital campaign that will support um, efforts related to both renovations, um, the possibility of establishing an endowment um, that again can become part of our sustainability model. Any questions there before? There. Can you tell me more about the capital campaign and what renovations would happen? Because in that time frame, the 346 main would already be open and operating. Is there a different facility? Um, not at this point in time. Um, what we are hoping is that the capital campaign is that we will get individuals who may pledge over a period of time. So there may be some of those that still um, are, are coming in toward the end of that period. Um, we are also um, looking at a more of an integrated cam campaign as well as to allowing people to give to what aspect of early childhood speaks to them. And that may be the building, but it also may be operations, um, staff salaries. It may be um, different to each individual, maybe sponsoring a childcare spot 
for, for a year. Um, so we're open to all aspects of what that campaign might reveal to us over time. Okay, so what I did wanna make you aware of is um, this Sunday, we are actually having um, a community input session um, to gather input and inspiration and dreams from, from families and community members um, at the public library. Um, there'll be one session at one o'clock and one at two o'clock. Um, we're looking at four specific areas. So kind of the design, the palette, the feel of um, the new facility, the community aspects, what makes you feel welcome and included in those spaces. Um, family friendly features, what would make things easier for you to come to and experience um, this, as well as collaboration. What other aspects of our community do you want to see in that space? And do you want to be able to access um, and have us collaborate with? So um, I invite you all to attend. I invite um, anyone in Douglas County to attend. It will be about a 10 to 15 minute presentation, kind of of the concept. And then we will. Um, turn everyone loose to start on, on uh, post-it notes, begin posting around the room related to those four different topic areas. Anything else, questions? Just a couple of questions. You know, on your slide, it says that you'll have renovation plans and costs by December. And I think we're gonna talk more about that at our business meeting as well. Um, do you, how is the center and the pro, you know some of it is grant funding are you getting what's your base for private support on it as well you know sort of walk us through maybe a broad overview of the budget for the center altogether yeah um we actually are looking at um just beginning to launch our campaign so we're feeling out those um private sector donations, um, both from a business component as well as individual donors, um, foundation components as well. Um, some of those require us to have a firmer cost in hand before we can move forward with those explorations. Um, so we are being very cautious in terms of, of moving forward um, with anyone until we know we've got the details in place. Now we are, as we've moved forward, we have anticipated that this the renovation cost would probably be around a $3 million renovation. So that has been the number we've been working with as we've moved forward. Um, but we also want to make sure that we go forward with uh, the best estimate that we can provide, given the information we have. So the renovation is equal to the cost of the building. Is that what you're telling us? What I'm telling, uh, what I'm saying is that to create a facility like this would have cost at least that amount of money um, for the building acquisition costs plus renovation costs. Some of the benefits we have related to this particular building is that it is within a core of neighborhoods, as well as our um, medical and behavioral health um, corridor because oftentimes what happens is to get the facility um, square footage that you need and the land that you need, you oftentimes have to go to an area of your community that is far removed from a family, from a neighborhood. Um, so that is one of the benefits of us selecting something that is already internal to our community. Will your, will your capital campaign include the Kennedy building as well or only renovations to the main building? Um, what we are planning is that the capital campaign would result, um, involve 346 Main Street only. Part of what we want to do is focus on the full model, get it implemented, so then we can move forward with the knowledge of how did this function, what is that sustainable tuition model, and then be able to implement it more easily in other spaces so we can move one more quickly and have a better estimate as to what costs are upfront. So to that end, can you just remind us um, what services are currently being provided at the Kennedy Building? And then, uh, you know, you mentioned the closet, um, which is, I'm not surprised that it's been so successful. Is that an example of something that's open to all families, regardless of residents within the county? Um, because it's a school district building. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um 
right now that that building um, is host to the community clothing closet, which is available to any family with children under the age of five in Douglas County. We do not have a other eligibility restrictions related to that. We know that every family with a child under five has needs that change drastically and pretty quickly with young children as young children grow. So what we are doing with all of our services is we are not restricting them based on any income or eligibility requirements, but what we are doing is capturing information. So we do know that those are Douglas County families um, that we're serving and um, we don't have any specific instances where we are tying them to either the Lawrence Public School System or one of our other Douglas County public school systems. What are the other services that are happening at the Kennedy Center though, right besides the closet? Right, um, actually programming is happening there. That's where we have our responsive caregiving program is happening there in the evenings. Um, on Tuesday evenings, they plan to do that three times a year. So three different series of six sessions, um, as well as the Grow and Go series, which is every Thursday from 10 to 11, which is open to any family with young children under the age of five who want to participate in that. What we're using those also opportunities for, particularly like Grow and Go, um, is an opportunity for individuals to discover our services, what we provide, be able to have us able to explain a little bit more what the options are, what's available to them um, as they begin to consider and we build a relationship of trust um, that they're able to access those other services. That is also the provider resource library is also housed um, at Kennedy at this point in time. And we are looking to have um, a specific uh, library that is for families with children under the age of five um, that we've uh, put into our Giving for Good campaign with the Douglas County Community Foundation to help us fund um, furniture to help us utilize that space in another classroom at Kennedy. So we're hopeful that that will be up and running early um, in 2023. Um, it's also a meeting spot for our family resource coordinator. So typically if, if um, that individual is meeting with families, it's often tied to maybe one of those other services or programs that we talk about. So that is where they can make their connection and then that individual will help them with any outreach to other services that they need. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also just, I know you're working on figuring out what that sustainable tuition model um, would be and that the um, vision for that is for it to be sliding scale you talked about and also um, taking into consideration DCF subsidies so I guess I have a two-part question one is it fair to assume that part of the Family Resource Center is helping support families with signing up for DCF subsidies and being able to get them enrolled with that and because um, that can take a long time and then my other question is um, the as I'm sure you know, there's a, quite an income bracket where DCF subsidies are not possible for somebody and it's still a significant cost. So can you talk about if there are any other types of subsidies or scholarship programs um, that either is gonna be part of the center or sort of a supported resource that you're able to make connections to? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for bringing up um, <clears throat> the DCF child care subsidies. One of the things that we have right now and as part of our family resource coordinator role is that we have a small fund um, that was made available through the United Way that um, is what we consider a, a DCF bridging fund. And so we know that when families apply for um, childcare subsidies, that the process for approval just to get the paperwork through, even if they have presumed eligibility, we know they're gonna qualify it takes a minimum of four to six weeks for that application to be processed. Sometimes it takes more. We had our first family who utilized this fund. She was already receiving DCF subsidies when she had her second child and was beginning to have that child enter the same childcare facility, but she had to go through an update process, which unfortunately was lost. Um, and the, the response was, well, just apply again rather than them find, find it and move forward, it was apply again, which then added to that. So what we were able to do was step in with the fund that we um, are administering for through the United Way funding is that we were able to provide tuition um, for 
those children in the childcare facility that they knew they were gonna be in um, uh, for two months while that process got worked out. So that is something that we wanna continue. We anticipate um, raising specific dollars that can be in that, so that can be an ongoing fund regardless of any grant funding that might be happening in the community. So, and we also do know that yes, um, oftentimes families may not qualify, but it is still a significant burden for them to have childcare. Um, Positive Bright Start administers a, a scholarship program for our community related to early childhood. Um, what happens with that is facilities have to be participating in that program. And then if they have a family in that situation, the, they begin to work with Positive Bright Start to apply for those scholarships. What we anticipate and hope for is that um, again, giving individuals in our community the opportunity to, to fund what aspects of this model speaks to them is that we will then be able to increase what is in that scholarship fund. Um, because right now that is funded through block grant dollars and we know it, we know we need to have more available in our community than we can do through that particular grant. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay, well, thank you so much for being here and thanks for your flexibility and coming and being in uh, County Commission Court with us this afternoon. <laughs> so we really appreciate the update and I'm excited um, to see how the next year goes. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Jill. We are adjourned until our 530 business meeting. <laughs>